Welcome to this, uh, the first of the University of Technology's Big Thinking Future Fashion Series, Fashion, Luxury and Resilience. My name is Timo Rissen and I'm an Associate Professor of Fashion and Textiles as well as the Course Director of Fashion and Textiles at the University of Technology, Sydney. Today's discussion will examine the role and meaning of fashion and luxury today, how the industry may respond and recover from the profound impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, and the future opportunities and possibilities for the industry. I'd now like to introduce our panel for today. So first, Carla Zampatti, AO. Carla Zampatti is the Executive Chairman of Carla Zampatti Property Limited, and this year she celebrates an epic accomplishment of 55 years in the industry. Carla is without a doubt the matriarch of the Australian fashion industry, and not only as a result of her success and achievements, in design and business, but also because of her enduring commitment um, and to mentoring and supporting the next generation of Australian fashion talent. In 2018, Carla launched the $25,000 Carla Zampatti Foundation Design Award, which to date has benefited three graduates from the UTS Honours Program uh, to pursue further study overseas. Carla is the board member of the Australian Multicultural Foundation, the European Australian Business Council, Sydney Dance Company, MCA Foundation and UTS's uh, Vice Chancellor's Industry Advisory Board. So, welcome, Carla. Thank you. Julianne Morrison has extensive experience internationally and locally building and leading iconic brands such as Gucci, Bulgari, Moschino, Sesame Bite, David Lawrence, Marks, and Guess. She has been a managing director based in London within the LVMH Group a finalist in the Australian Business Woman of the Year Award, a non-executive director of Maya, and a long-time advisor to Carla Zampatti. Julianne has held various roles within the fashion and related industries from sales, marketing and buying, to HR director where she developed and delivered training courses. As a, as a managing director, she has worked across global markets from Asia to Europe to the US in managing brand licensing, retail and wholesale. Julianne holds a Master of Arts, Creative Media, and consults on branding and business strategy. So welcome, Julianne. Thank you. And then, Dr. Toby Slade uh, is a new associate professor of, at UTS in fashion and textiles and an authority on Japanese fashion and popular culture. Before coming to UTS, Toby worked for more than 16 years at the University of Tokyo and Bunka Gakuen University in Japan. His current research focuses on the history, contemporary forms, and changing meaning of luxury in Japan. He is the author of two books, Japanese Fashion, A Cultural History, the first English language book to explore the entire historical sweep of fashion and clothing in Japan, and Introducing Japanese Popular Culture, which looks at fashion as a central component of popular culture. Toby is a founding member of the Research Collective for Decolonializing Fashion, and he was a recent guest editor of a special issue of fashion theory that explores decolonizing fashion that came out in September 2020. So welcome, Toby. Thank you. I would now, now like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, upon whose ancestral lands the university campus today stands, and from Carla's home, where we are also speaking today. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past and present acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for these lands. I would like to begin uh, with you, Carla, and with some questions um, uh, to, to sort of open up the discussion about luxury fashion in Australia. So first, my first question to you is, what have been your experiences of crisis for Australia in fashion? Crisis, uh, I have experienced about four of them in my career, having been around this long. Um, what I have found is that people, after a crisis, usually move to a better product. That's why we have been very successful post-crisis. Um, I think it's really important as a designer to stay very close to your clients and try and assess what kind of things they need and uh, try and give them those. But I think our product is, has a longevity look. It, um, it's classic but yet modern 
and they know that they can put it in their wardrobe. It won't fall apart. It'll be something they can put their hand on and wear in five or ten years' time. So the, I think it's the first of the luxury brands because uh, it's not how many things you have. It's just the quality of the things you have in your wardrobe and how often you can wear them. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. And you pointed to something else really important, which is the relationship. Because you said, you said something about the relationship between you and the customer. Yeah. So can you say a little bit more about that? My relationship with my customer has been very close from the beginning because I started in 65 when women are just beginning to take on responsibility outside their homes and I was one of them and kind of I lived their life so I understood perfectly what their needs and it was really a wonderful position to be in and I've understood the position ever since because I'm still working in a career so I know what I need every day and what I don't need. And so I think it's, a, and I need clothes at last that I feel confident in, that I can relax in and forget about, but feel that I look appropriate. And I think all my clients feel the same. And they understand that I have that input into my fashion design. Now, what kind of future do you think fashion schools like UTS uh, should be preparing students for? I think it has a huge future because you you produce wonderful art, artistic, creative people, and that is the most important part of fashion, that you have to be mindful that if you design something ordinary, other people have already done it. The only way you'll continue staying in business is by creating new and individual pieces. I learned that a long time ago with my first retail store. The people came to me for certain things which were different. And, and so I've stuck to that. And if designers work out very quickly what their special, special quality is and then develop that, I think they will stay in business a long time. That's a, that's a wonderful insight about the importance of point of view. and um, Of self. Yeah. Your yeah. own input is what they come to you for. Yeah. So don't be somebody else. There's no <laughs> point. <laughs> yes. Now, in your experience, and you mentioned that you have weathered through at least four crises in your time, um, how do you see that we can install resilience in fashion students, both in a business and a stylistic sense, uh, for them to flourish in the future of Australian fashion? Well, I think today is probably easier because of internet. Technology has been wonderful. Our business has grown tremendously during this COVID time. Um, and so even if you, even if a department store doesn't like you and doesn't want to buy you, if you develop a relationship with your clients outside of that on I think if you're clever and do PR in the right way, you could develop a brand. And I know that students at UTS all want to have, do startups. And I think that there's a great future for that, particularly in Australia. We are far away and we're finding increasingly world is coming to us through internet to buy. So I think they, they, there's a great opportunity there to actually, if you can teach them about the business of online buying as an extra curriculum perhaps, might be good. Excellent. And, um, and I do really want to acknowledge you and your tremendous support of our graduates, so thank I you. I think you have very talented young people and I love supporting them. It's the future of the fashion industry, let's face it. Yes. I might turn to you, Toby, now. In our current age, how can we define and also how can we justify luxury? I tend to define luxury as broadly as possible. Um, and just luxury is the things that take us beyond the economic necessities of life. Um, prices we pay or time we take even that maybe makes no economic sense but makes emotional sense or makes some other sort of sense. So that could be your morning coffee or or um, a fancy car, uh, 
or clothes made by an artist, but it could also be just a pair of woolly socks that no one ever sees, that just feel pleasurable. Um, so I think luxury certainly um, has an element of conspicuous consumption, but it's also about private and quiet pleasures that go beyond necessary subsistence. Um, and in that way, I think it tells us very interesting things about a person or society, what they are willing to do uh, above and beyond what's necessary. Um, Justification is kind of an interesting question because uh, throughout most of history, luxury has been a moral question and it's not until the Scottish Enlightenment and David Hume that starts to couple the refinement of luxury and happiness and um, well-being. Um, and that's sort of a, an issue about freedom. People shouldn't have some arbitrary uh, system that tells them what the good life is, people should be able to choose um, the good life for themselves. And so I think historically there was a great decoupling of morality and luxury that happened in the 18th century. I think what has been happening recently um, is a little bit of a re-moralisation of luxury, particularly around debates about equality and about sustainability. Um, uh, However, you know, in, in that definition that I put out about what luxury is, um, luxury really is the key to a more sustainable future because all the things that are embedded in luxury fashion are the things that we need to get us beyond the environmental problems that we have. Clothes that, are, that last longer, clothes that uh, use better materials, clothes that have transparent supply chains, uh, clothes that use... Um, uh, a sustainable and, and just level of, of, of labour and compensation. All these are things that luxury does. But most importantly, if we want to convince people to have less, you know, the only thing that's better than more clothes is better clothes. And that's where luxury really comes in because luxury makes clothes that make you look better, clothes that fit you. Yes, yes, and, and they're the clothes you love for longer the clothes you're less likely to uh, discard and, and require more. So um, I really think luxury is an absolutely essential part of life and uh, the, fashion, the luxury fashion industry is an essential part of how we get out of our current environmental crisis in the fashion industry. And both you and Carla speak to the quality of the relationships as well uh, in, in many different ways, both between the, the brand and the customer but also the kinds of relationships within the brand and their supply chains and and um, and and yeah that's a that's a really great insight as well um, Toby in your research on Japan how does significant crisis change luxury and and change fashion uh, well Japan in my study Japan went through a, an in, a huge economic crisis and and more recently uh, a, a catastrophic uh, earthquake, tsunami, nuclear crisis. Um, and uh, before that economic crisis in the 1980s and 1990s, Japan was consuming more luxury, I think, than the rest of the world combined, just in per capita. And overall, Japan was a luxury uh, paradise. Um, but by 2011, it was about half of what it was in, in the, at the peak in 1996. And if you took out small leather goods, purses, uh, wallets, handbags that had become part of sort of a gift economy that you might, a, a, a child might receive on graduation from their, from their parents or a couple might give as a gift, if you took that out, it was even less. Um, so my research is sort of about what had happened. Why had Japan gone away from uh, luxury? And, and even though the economy had um, completely recovered, and even though the economy was, people were spending just as much as before, they didn't seem to be spending it on the kind of luxury they were spending it on before. Um, and my contention is that they are still spending it on luxury, it's just no longer the luxury that turns up in those figures. The luxury that they are now spending it on tends to be smaller brands, tends to be more personal experiences, um, uh, because I think as Carla said, when you have a crisis, people have to reevaluate. People have to think about what's really important to them. And for Japanese consumers, I think they realized that the kind of luxury that was being sold to them 
was, was not satisfactory. It was sort of a, a branded luxury and what consumers really wanted, if you are a consumer that's interested in uh, luxury beyond just the object itself, if you want a story, if you want an art artistry, if you want sort of a craftsmanship, then just putting a logo on a polo shirt won't cut it. So I think what happened in the Japanese experience, as, uh, as Carla said has happened in the Australian experience, is that, that consumers started to want more quality and they wanted to have luxury goods that were connected to culture, connected to place, connected to the craftsmanship that they had in Japan. Now, even the Japanese have a cultural cringe and, um, and especially as you kind of spoke to, especially in luxury fashion, um, how is that overcome? So ab absolutely, this is uh, something that Japan and Australia has in common in that both our cultures have a little bit of a cultural cringe and, and require people to be validated by Europe or America before they can um, be truly celebrated across all sorts of industries. Um, and I think this is a little bit of a, a colonial remnant in that it's assumed in, the, in a sort of colonial logic that Europe is the font of everything stylish and luxurious and that you know, European luxury is actually a central symbol of civilization. And um, I think at, at moments like these, we realize, well, actually, we can do uh, whatever they do just as well. I think Japan realized that in the 90s, that they had designers, they had a craft culture that was equivalent to Italy or to France. And um, that perspective change in crisis um, uh, allowed them to sort of reconsider. Um, uh, Japan in 1985 was the second biggest economy in the world. And yet the symbols of material success in Japan were sort of mass produced luxury brands uh, from Europe. And so the way that fashion, well, I think people often assume that fashion is maybe personal, maybe trivial, maybe not important and outside the serious remit of nation building. But actually, Clothing and fashion is central to our sense of heritage, our sense of self-respect, our sense of ambition. And I think that's what Japan realised, that they needed something that was authentic, a luxury that was authentic to who they were, the sense of their craftsmanship, a sense of their place. And I think that's what uh, Australia um, is doing right is now. Doing right now yeah. Getting to an With authentic... By Australian. It's amazing how many women are coming to us because they know we manufacture in Australia. It's really good. It is, and, and, and just a few days ago I was in class with my students and, and I had to remind them that they are people who improve people's quality of life. That's what we do in fashion. Often people outside of fashion, like you said, Toby, think that what we do is a bit trivial, but we all wear clothing. It touches everyone's lives. <laughs> yeah. It Literally really does. And I have women saying to me, I met my husband, I got married in this, my granddaughter uh, graduated in that. And it's wonderful. It their own lives, their association with fashion is a very personal one and very deep. It is. Thank you, Toby. I, I'm now turning to Julianne. Um, so Julianne, how can Australian fashion brands be perceived as luxury in the global market? Well, I think that uh, the best approach to that is not to aspire to be luxury and pretty much ignore the idea of um, compelling yourself to be luxury as the most important thing. Um, I think that it's a matter of positioning your brand very distinctively, being authentic to your own creativity, standing back and looking at the whole range in the market and really competing and positioning your brand um, within those markets and competing. It's also about learning from the excellence in luxury brand management that does come out of Europe and Japan and um, the US and applying some of those skills but to your distinctive brand and position and, and inspiration. And I always think it's very useful to look at the market with customer eyes and look at it from the point of view of saying, well, when I see all the range of things available to me uh, in this offer, perhaps around these values, do I pick myself? And if I don't pick myself, then what are the reasons? And if I do, what are the reasons? So it's being very outward 
yeah. um, and not too concerned about uh, the idea of the luxury goods industry. Excellent points and, um, and particularly your speaking into authenticity and speaking into creativity and imagination I think are such excellent lessons. Mm. Um, now, what should be the direction and priorities for the Australian fashion industry at the moment, in your view? Well, as we've discussed, I think that um, COVID has been a circuit breaker and people have become much more interested in what is happening locally. So taking that idea of living locally, which is a richer way to live and certainly a more sustainable way to live, then I think one can connect to local community, local culture, uh, locally made, which Carla has uh, touched on, uh, which I think is extremely important. And I think that Australians and perhaps the rest of the world may not recognise Australia as a source of luxury, um, but I think the distinctiveness of made in Australia as opposed to made in some traditionally large making markets in Asia, um, that drives through to say to the customer, this is actually more exclusive yeah. because I'm buying something that is not um, generically available from every brand. So that will accumulate power over time if brands start to seek out making in Australia, which is also encompasses this live locally yeah. idea. I think that's an excellent point because when you manufacture locally, I would say that you're also a custodian of culture because yes. we don't often think of manufacturing as part of culture, but it really is. Yes. And when we, when we support it, we really are custodians of culture yes. as well. And if we make locally also, we are making in the context of what works in our market. So for example, Australia is a small market. So from that point of view, it's important to make in small quantities and to have the reactivity and the speed to be creative and to meet demand. Uh, so you do not then create a brand led by supply, but a brand led by creativity. And in some ways you've already spoken to this, but looking sort of ahead into the future, what do you, uh, what do you believe will be the future of luxury fashion in Australia? Look, I think that uh, luxury fashion will continue to prosper in Australia, whether it be international or local. And I think the reason for this is that we are a, a prosperous and affluent country. We are very outward looking, so well traveled and we understand what's going on globally and the world has also come to us. Adventurous. Um, adventurous, we are adventurous. And I think the other thing is that we're very optimistic. Mm. Uh, and, and this is um, supported by the way we live our lives and the way we travel and the way that we um, invest in fashion and things that we love. So there is a, a very important life, perhaps slightly, slightly um, changed or adapted uh, about luxury in Australia. In terms of Australian luxury, one of the areas that I think is a very big opportunity is uh, the Couture Bespoke Limited Edition area. And we see some brands now emerging in this area because one can make things that are quite limited in numbers or even uh, couture and made to measure. Uh, and we're very good at that. And there is an underlying industry in that in Australia um, that I think can be developed um, quite, quite significantly. In some ways that connects to my final question to you um, because we're really thinking about the, the, the next generation in education. So what skills do emerging designers need to develop in order to be successful uh, in the fashion industry of the future? I think they need to uh, be very open and curious and learn. I think learning is um, sometimes more valuable than knowing. They need to understand the uh, history of 20th century fashion and how it intersects with culture because this gives them an abundance of aesthetic resources to call on to be creative. Uh, they need to uh, be resilient, focused and want to make money mm -hmm. because that will uh, sus sustain yeah, their business. Their business. Um, and I think that uh, they need to understand over time, it may not be instantaneous, but over time who they are as a, as a creative person and what their brand stands for. 
And once again, standing back and looking at that with customer eyes. Excellent, thank you. Um, now, uh, all, of, all three of you, is there anything that we haven't said about luxury and fashion in Australia that, that um, you feel a burning need to, to add to the conversation? It's been really excellent, but if there is anything to add, um, please, please speak. Well, I think it would be um, good for the industry in Australia to become more enmeshed with fashion education and institutions. Um, and for those two things to be uh, more supportive to each other, uh, because the industry is, is big, mm -hmm. um, it can be uh, bigger, it can take market share for Im from imported brands, and to do that it requires a high level of skills really at an international operational level. So whatever kind of uh, enhancement of training and ongoing education for the industry uh, can occur, I think, is really valuable. I, I often find that in Australia there's um, a narrative of inability. Oh, we can't do manufacturing in Australia, it's too hard, we don't have the, the labour uh, costs or whatever. Um, or we can't do luxury in Australia. But, you know, these, these are narratives that are often patently false. And I think an important thing often to give to students is just to push those myths over and say, well, of course you can do manufacturing in Australia. Of course we can have a world-class luxury market in Australia. Um, because these, these myths often have nothing behind them. Yes. Mm. And I think that's about courage. And I think what Julianne said about bespoke, I think is very important mm -hmm. because um, small runs are mm -hmm. very, very popular, of top quality, very special items. Yeah. And if we think about all the people who are making for weddings, for example, yeah. you know, which is a thriving and fabulous business at the highest standards of making, uh, that already exists. So that can be, I think, uh, developed. The other thing that I um, had meant, wanted to say was that the Australian market, to make money in the Australian market is about being optimum, not maximum. And so that's a fantastic opportunity for luxury because uh, so many ca cases in which Australian fashion fails and international fashion fails in this market uh, is by overextending mm. And really creating a cost base and a supply chain that starts to drive your brand um, and therefore you lose the distinction of your brand. So the brand is the key asset. Mm -hmm. Product and, and brand. Yes, product and, and brand. Design, design, yeah. product and brand. Exactly. And understanding what that optimum place is for your brand in this market. Excellent. That's a really excellent point to, for us to conclude on. So. Um, we will wrap up the discussion there. So thank you, Julianne, thank you, Carla, and thank you, Toby. Um, to learn more about the UTS research and, and teaching work, please visit uts.edu.au. Um, now, Julianne is uh, also working in collaboration with UTS um, Open on a fashion masterclass called Brand Strategy. Uh, and so stay tuned in 2021. Um, it'll be around March. Um, but we will be sharing more details in, in coming weeks. Until our next event, thank you very much from UTS.